Presented by Caltech. Now, I'd like to introduce Alec Brenner. Alec is currently a senior majoring in geology. He's done three surfs, and this past summer, he worked with Dr. Joe Kirschfink. Excellent. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so as, as mentioned, I did my surf last summer with Joe Kirschfink in the paleomagnetism lab here at Caltech, as well as a lot of work in the mineralogy lab with George Rossman, who I did my surf with last summer as well. Now, rather than explain this dry academic title, in the spirit of geology, let's take a field trip. So we're going to go to the Jack Hills. They're this series of low, rolling, unassuming, dry desert hills in the western outback of Australia, about 400 kilometers from the nearest notable human settlement. And in these hills, the rocks are a mixture of sedimentary rocks, but among them are sandstones and conglomerates. Here is a conglomerate with a geologist sitting there for scale. And these were deposited about 3 billion years ago. In these conglomerates and sandstones, there are grains of many rocks that are older than that 3 billion year mark. And among those are crystals of a mineral called zircon. They're very small. They rarely exceed a millimeter in size. But they're incredibly old and, in fact, easy to date. It turns out, if you actually take the distribution of ages of the zircons in the Jack Hills, seven out of eight of them fall between three and four billion years old. But one out of eight is, exceeds four billion years old. These zircons are what are called the Hadean Jack Hills zircons. And in fact, the oldest piece of rock that originated on Earth that is known to science is this grain here with this spot in it dating back to 4.4 billion years ago. Keep in mind that the Earth itself is only about 4.5 billion years old. So this, this grain of zircon was around when Earth was only about 100 million years old or so. As such, these incredibly old materials represent an archive of early Earth history information that geologists would love to get their hands on. And as such, they're also the origin of a bunch of extraordinary claims, one of which I'm going to be investigating today. So this claim was published in 2014 by some scientists at the University of Rochester. They measured the magnetization of the grains of zircon from the Jack Hills. And their data points for the Jack Hills are the red points on this plot. Age is going back in time this way. And here's the magnetic field strength that they measure, the paleo intensity, as it's called. Their data points suggest that the zircons preserve a magnetic field from early Earth that is comparable in strength to the recent current field on Earth. And that's an extraordinary claim. That would suggest that the paleodynamo, that is the dynamo, the convection inside of the molten liquid core of Earth, had started up within a few hundred million years of Earth's formation. Turns out there are some complications, though. And this is the subject of a raging debate right now in the paleomagnetics community. They all center around how exactly magnetization is preserved inside of zircons. The image up here is actually not of a Jack Hill zircon. This is a zircon crystal from actually California up in Long Valley that's only about 750,000 years old, which geologically speaking compared to Jack Hills is incredibly young. But as you can see, this zircon crystal contains an inclusion of an apatite. That apatite in a magnetic map lights up bright red in indicating, therefore, that it's actually what's carrying the magnetization. And specifically, it's not actually the apatite. It is a thin veneer of iron oxide minerals around its surface, notably hematite and magnetite. And that's actually what's responsible for magnetizing a zircon, because zircon itself intrinsically cannot carry a magnetic field. The problem here is that when you measure zircons from the Jack Hills, you, there are a few uncertain factors. The first is high temperature remagnetization. This is a process whereby heating of the zircons after they've crystallized can erase any signal and in fact overprint it with a younger signal of magnetization. And this, this is because once you exceed the Curie temperature of the mineral, that is the temperature at which it gains magnetism, it will 
essentially erase any evidence of previous magnetization. So you don't want to be measuring younger magnetic fields. You want to be measuring the one, the magnetic field from when the zircon crystallized. There's also the issue, the more subtle issue, of primary or secondary nature of these magnetic minerals. So if it's primary, if a mineral is primary, that means that it crystallized along with the zircon crystal about four plus billion years ago. If it's secondary, that means that it crystallized later, either due to chemical or thermal alteration or hydrothermal activity. And it turns out the Jack Hills zircon host rock, the conglomerates and sandstones, have had a lot of thermal and chemical alteration. So naturally, it's something to be worried about. So what I wanted to do with my surf was to take a sort of independent mineralogical view of the Jack Hill Zircon paleomagnetism debate. First off, I wanted to address the question of what inclusions, what magnetic minerals were actually responsible for carrying the magnetic signal that is observed. Second, are these inclusions primary, that is formed along with the zircon, or secondary, formed later? And finally, are there signs of metamictization? This is another process whereby ionizing radiation actually disorders the crystal structure of a mineral. And it turns out that zircons are incredibly prone to this. And it was incredibly surprising when I was originally doing the, the paper, like the, the research for what I should be doing in this study, that no previous authors had actually examined this. And it's an incredibly easy test to perform. It takes five minutes on a Raman spectrometer to actually see whether a zircon is metamict or not. And that's important because metamictization can actually remagnetize a mineral. So if there's metamictization present, that's a huge red flag and people should be looking for it more. So without further ado, I'd like to jump into the results. I'm going to show you some images first of the zircons that we studied. We studied five. They were provided by a professor at CU Boulder. And uh, they all have ages um, already assigned to them. This one is our oldest. It's about 4.32 billion years old, which I just love letting that number sink in. It's, it's an it's, these are incredible, incredible materials. And you can see it's quite small. It's only about mm, half a millimeter or less long. But you can see that there's a lot going on inside and outside of it. There are all these little features inside as well as pits and actual analytical spots from the microprobe used to date them on the outside. But I'd like to draw your attention to the highlighted features. Those are actually all inclusions. They're inside. And we're working on trying to identify these with a Raman spectrometer. The problem is they're so small that they're presenting some difficulty. Um, however, we didn't have just this zircon. As I said, we had five. And one of them is actually quite large. This one is almost a full millimeter wide, which is gigantic in Jack Hill zircon terms. And as you can see, there's a lot going on in this one as well. There's this gigantic void with all of this brown stuff coating, on the, coating it on the inside. There's in, there are complex little inclusions here, here. There's a long one here, up here. You could spend days looking at this single grain and then analyzing it. I'd like to call your attention again to this large void space and that long crystalline grain right there, which are also inclusions. And specifically, this one that with all that brown stuff coating it has hematite. That brown stuff is hematite, which is actually a secondary mineral in the Jack Hills. So that's important. That tells us that there are secondary minerals present that can carry a magnetic field, as hematite can, and a very strong one at that. Additionally, the rutile grain up here looks like it has some brown spots as well, although they're much smaller and, again, very difficult to identify with a Raman spectrometer. But the main thing to notice here, aside from those, is that this zircon is littered with cracks. And these cracks provide the actual mechanism for putting the hematite there. That is, they, those cracks allow for hydrothermal fluids to enter the crystal at a later date, later, to, later than its crystallization, probably when it was actually inside the host rock that we found it in. And along those cracks, the hydrothermal fluids can actually precipitate the hematite out. So that's important. Next, let's dive into metamictization. So without getting too complicated, this is, these are Raman spectra. Essentially, what these are are 
measurements of the Raman shift or the energy levels with, contained within the material. Essentially, each one of these peaks represents a bond type in the material. And this is just intensity that shows how strong those peaks are, how well represented they are. And well crystallized materials, that is, materials that are not metamic, that, they, that have not been radiation damaged, show very sharp, extremely well defined peaks. Meanwhile, metamic materials have broadened peaks because they're less crystalline intrinsically. And as you can see, this, this is a peak from an unaltered zircon, and this is a peak from a metamic zircon. As you can see, the peaks here are incredibly sharp, well defined, and in fact, they even preserve the secondary little peak on the side here that's preserved here as well. So the five zircons that we studied were all totally unaltered in any reasonable way, at least. And as a result, we can say that the, in these zircons, at least, metamictization is not a significant process. However, we can't rule it out. So to conclude from work that I've done this summer, there's pervasive secondary mineralization and alteration. Specifically, there's precipitation of hematite along crack walls, and that's probably responsible for carrying a significant secondary magnetic remnants. However, we're going to need to do some paleomagnetic work later in order to actually tease out what the magnitude of that secondary magnetization is. Additionally, there's no metamictization in our samples, but we can't really rule it out as of yet. Of course, this is an ongoing project, and we're actually collaborating with two professors, one at MIT, Ben Weiss, and the other, Roger Fu, at Harvard, who are both working on this problem full time. And there are three major uh, lines of reasoning that we're looking at right now. First off, we're doing rock magnetic tests. This is actually a magnetic map made using a squid microscope here at Caltech of one of the epoxy disks in which these zircons are currently held. And you can actually see, I'm pointing it out here, it's a little tricky, but there's a little red dot, and that turns out is the oldest zircon that we're studying. So it's promising. These things actually do carry a magnetization that we're able to see, and currently we're actually about to run all of these samples through the squid microscope in order to actually figure out what their magnetizations are in high resolution. Additionally, we're going to try and do a measurement that's really neat called lithium in zircon geothermometry, or geospeedometry, as I've also heard it called. This is a technique whereby, under an electron microscope, we look at the concentration gradients of lithium inside of the zircon crystal. And what that actually tells you, based on how, how sharp those gradients are, that is, how, how quickly in space you go from high concentration of lithium to low concentration of lithium, you can tell what maximum temperature and how long at that temperature a zircon was subjected to. So that's really neat. That can tell us sort of what its alteration history is thermally. Finally, we're going to look, be look, taking a step back and looking at the bulk rock from which the Jack Hill zircons come, that conglomerate and sandstone mix from the Jack Hills. And we're looking specifically at pyrotites and other magnetic minerals inside of that rock. What that will be able to tell us is what sort of alteration history the rock that the zircons are in has been subjected to itself, and therefore the zircons as well. So with that, I'd like to thank Professor Joe Kirschfink, whose lab I did this work out of, and George Rossman, whose mineralogy lab and instruments I used for much of my project, as well as Professor Steve Moisish at CU Boulder, who provided all of our zircons for this study as well as Ben Weiss and Roger Fu at MIT and Harvard, respectively, who we're collaborating with right now. I'd also like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Sam Vidopia. Sam's in the audience today with us. On behalf of the late Mr. G. Edward Bryan for sponsoring this surf through actually a second named surf with you guys, so thank you very much. And as always, the Caltech Surf Office for running everything in the background, making sure everything went very smoothly, and making sure I had a great summer. With that, I'll end. Thank you. Yes. So how does the presence of the secondary magnetic minerals affect your uh, interpretation of the paleodynamo argument? So if there are, so it doesn't necessarily indicate what the primary magnetization is. The primary magnetization 
That is the magnetization from when the zircons crystallized in excess of 4 billion years ago actually tells you about the paleodynamo and whether or not it was present or active. The secondary minerals are something that can trip you up when you're doing that analysis, right? So if there's a secondary mineral present that has a secondary magnetization, it can totally override whatever signal you could observe from the primary, primary minerals. Does that, does that make sense? Right, so I'm saying, do you think that that previous study may have been influenced by... Oh, secondary? absolutely, yes. And that's the major criticism of their study. They actually, they essentially just took a bunch of zircons that they had isolated using non-magnetic methods and done it in a clean room and all that wonderful stuff. And they essentially just put it under a magnetic microscope and measured them without actually looking at what the inclusions were inside of them that could carry a magnetization. And fortunately, that group, having now been criticized heavily, is actually doing some very careful and very elegant work, actually, to actually tease out what exactly is carrying the magnetization and be a lot more careful with their sample selection. And this is part of that effort. Yes? So I guess I had two, they were probably naive questions and not a no, go ahead. So when you get these rocks, how do you actually determine that there's zircon versus other types of rocks? And then do you guys actually analyze the elemental composition of the, of the rocks? Because you mentioned at the end of the talk, looking at the lithium content. Yeah. I guess I was curious how you actually could tease that out as well. Okay, great, great questions. Um, so the rock com comes to other labs. We didn't actually do the isolation of the zircons from the rock. Um, but it comes to a lab to be essentially isolated using a bunch of different methods. They crush the rock up and using a bunch of heavy solvents and, uh, and magnetic methods actually, they isolate grains of zircon from the rest of the minerals in the rock. And you can confirm that these are zircon very easily with a Raman spectrometer, X-ray diffraction, all sorts of different methods. Um, as for elemental composition, it depends what sort of study you're doing, but in the case of our study, we want to do the lithium concentration. And you can really easily do it for most of the elements that would reasonably can be contained inside of a zircon with a basic SEM setup. Yes? Um, is there a possibility that in inclusions like the ones you showed us that don't have cracks near them or Great question, not necessarily air. However, there are trapped volatiles in some of these zircons, and that's work that other labs do mostly. But there are records of all sorts of minerals, um, quartz, rutile, apatite are common ones, um, plagioclase, muscovite. But also, there are inclusions that contain little, wa uh, little v vesicles of water, essentially. And some people want to use that as evidence right now to actually say that subduction was a common process on early Earth, which is another extraordinary claim and worth many, many more talks just like this. <laughs>